this is a very interdisciplinary uh, series with um, uh, contributions from education, uh, literary studies, uh, ICT, linguistic, semiotics. So very mixed uh, um, series of lectures and we think it's very fit to start with the world of education which our speakers today are meant to represent. It's very fit to start with the world of education for an opening section of an educational uh, um, series of lectures and also it, it's a very special time for the role of digital tools in education and it's certainly a time that has attracted our attention very much to the need to develop appropriate literacies for a multiplicity of tools and a multiplicity of situations and this is certainly a topic that our speakers today are particularly uh, fit for. I'll be very brief because none of you is here to listen to me, we're all here to listen to our, our speakers. If you want to learn more, my suggestion is that you go to their website, the New Learning <laughs> website, where I found a wealth of materials on their project, uh, on what they call their learning journey, which I read with a lot of interest, tracing their research interests from curriculum design for cultural diversity to literacy and multiliteracies civic pluralism and Australian multiculturalism, because they, they both uh, um, were active in, in Australia for a long time, although they're now based in the US. Workplace cultures, new media, new learning, analyzing academic knowledge systems, a new environment for assessment and learning, lots of interesting uh, things. Um, they're both professors in the Department of Education Policy, Organization and Leadership at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the US. Mary Calantis has also been Dean of the College of Education at the University of Illinois and before then she was Dean at the Faculty of Education, Language and Community Services at RMIT University Melbourne, Australia, President of the Australian Council of Deans of Education and many other key positions in, in uh, Australia. With Bill Pope, she's the author and editor of a number of books including New Learning, Elements of a Science of Education for Cambridge University Press, Literacies for Cambridge University Press, The Pedagogy of Multiliteracies for Paul Graves, and two, a two-volume grammar of multimodal meaning, making sense and adding sense for Cambridge University Press this year. Uh, Bill Cope, as well as Professor at Urbana-Champaign, is also adjunct professor at Charles Darwin University, Australia. He's also director of Common Ground Research Networks, a not-for-profit publisher and developer of social knowledge technologies. And he's also held key positions in Australia. I won't list them all. His research interests include theories and practices of pedagogy, cultural and linguistic diversity, new technologies for representation and communication. His recent research has focused on the development of digital writing and uh, digital writing and assessment technologies with the support of a number of major grants, US Department of Education, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, National Science Foundation. The result has been the CG Scholar Multimodal Writing and Assessment Environment. Among his publications are edited volumes on the future of the academic journal and e-learning ecologies and a book co-authored with, co with Calantis towards a semantic web connecting knowledge in academic research. Today they're here for a uh, small program uh, talking about passing multimodality towards a transpositional grammar. I'll leave the floor to you. I think Mary's talking. <laughs> well, to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Marina, for a very generous uh, introduction. And um, can I say uh, congratulations to all of you for continuing uh, these journeys of uh, discussion and uh, exchange in the Zoom world. Uh, <laughs> certainly education has changed and we all live almost daily in this Zoom environment and uh, it's a curious place to be and we don't know how long we'll be here and what it will mean for what we used to do and what we're going to do in the future. So 
Uh, congratulations to all the students who are there and all the faculty members. Uh, and thank you for being interested in what we have to uh, contribute and asking us to be part of this conversation. So we're going to put up our PowerPoint, which is also part of the Zoom experience <laughs> uh, now. And uh, I'll, I'll introduce, uh, can, so you have to allow us to share uh, the screen. So we'll do that now, Bill. Uh, no, we can't yet. So someone needs to Somebody on needs to uh, host disabled. So so you need Ah, we're hosting. Oh, we're Excellent. hosting. Very, very good. So what Negotiations we'll do is, on the fly. Um, <laughs> and, oh, let me get down here and get this here and I'll go. Um, there we are. And okay. Just, and let me just get it up onto the screen. Um, and we're ready to go. All right. Uh, it doesn't move past that first try for some reason. I don't know. Uh, um, the arrow doesn't? Yeah, so you have to go back and go to the second slide. I found that something in that first slide. All right. So, so let me just get it back up to full screen again, just a moment. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me get the next one. Here, Bill. Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay, so there you go. The, um, the behind the scenes become front of the scenes in this environment. So we're talking about multimodality and I, I want to um, just begin uh, a little bit about how we came uh, to, this, uh, to our understanding of the power and importance of multimodality uh, in our world for meaning making. So uh, almost, um, uh, see, it doesn't move forward, Bill. I don't know why. I don't know why the uh, it doesn't move. I think you can't use all the whole screen, then, Bill. No, folks. No, I tried it before. I, didn't, I couldn't figure it. So I think you'd better just leave it like that. Uh, let me just clean it up a bit so people are not looking at so much rubbish. All right. Um, let me go here and. Um, this out just okay you, you can keep going while i'm okay all right it. just a moment uh, there we go that's all better right. let's <laughs> move either we'll just have to do it manually no no it won't uh let me just see oh there it goes uh, the arrow will move now oh okay all right yeah. so uh almost and bill said it's a bit embarrassing to remember how long ago almost 27 years ago uh, we we uh, got together with a group of scholars uh, to initiate what we then call the multi literacies project. Uh, what we did, uh, we came together thinking that uh, the issues of performance in schools, because we were interested in schools uh, that at that time, uh, the gaps between those who were performing and those who were struggling, despite all our careers and everything that we had done as academics, the gaps were getting bigger. So we came together uh, in New London, um, and we brought, Bill and I brought together a number of scholars who are listed here. Uh, we put our personal identities outside the room and tried in a collective way to think about what the future was going to be like. How, how were we going to prepare people to be effective uh, into the future? Uh, and we came up with the manifesto, which we put in, uh, the, was published by the Harvard Ed Review, which was called a pedagogy of multiliteracies, designing social futures. So we were trying to uh, think about how we prepare adequately all learners uh, for a world uh, that was coming. And at that point, we had three things we wanted to say. First, that meaning making was going to be uh, what we called in the, uh, in, particularly in, in, in education, around the, the term of multiliteracies. Why did we say that? Well, we believe that people were bringing to the question and issue and practice of literacy a number of ways of making meaning, whether it was uh, dialects or languages or codes that they were using, and that we had to start thinking of meaning making in a plural way, that there were multi multiple versions of uh, literacy that were in play, both within a formal education setting and within a uh, uh, everyday life. And with that uh, understanding, we came to the second understanding was that variability was the main feature of meaning making. 
not standards, not canonical, not uh, structures, rigid structures, but meaning was variable in different cultural, social, and domain-specific contexts. And we argued then, way back then, that these differences were becoming more significant to our communication environment. And that, of course, led us to multimodality because it wasn't just different languages and different registers and different modes of engaging, but different modes, actually different types of meaning making through uh, writing, through uh, oral communication, through visual, through audio, gesture, tactile, you, you name it. Uh, these modes were becoming more important, particularly as the virtual and the digital was allowing us uh, to connect with each other across these different modes in powerful ways and sometimes more powerful than uh, the written linguistic modes that we were all very used, uh, used to. So what does that mean for us as educators? How do we come to understand the world of multiliteracies where variability really matters and multimodal uh, meaning making is key to uh, the world? We're still having trouble, Bill. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and share a different way. Um, just give me a moment and I'm going to share, see if this works. I'm going to share um, full screen. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is change that to full screen. Let's see if that works. Now, now try now. No, it's not working. Uh, I, I am sorry, but. And by the way, look, we, we are the hosts now and somebody, I hope somebody else is letting people into the room. I'm getting a message to let people into the room. We should actually probably be the co-host, not the host, but let's not worry about that. Let me just see why that won't work. Okay, that's not going to work either. Um, so let me go screen share. Um, let me, I'll do it that way again. This is part of the variability of many making. No, it's a part of the irregularity of Zoom. <laughs> um, she's a, there's a, well, I can tell, now wait there. Um, that's not moving on either. So I can just here. talk from the side. No, but you, but then people yeah. can't see the slides. Yeah, right. um, share windows. Okay, let me try again. Um, and let me go um, uh, share again. Where is Zoom? Okay, just give me a moment, folks. Um, uh, now let me just try. Um, now and see if this works. No, no, it's not going to work. So just go back and, and just do it manually, Bill. It won't. It can't, won't go manually. No, not with the full screen. Uh, it's this is not the full screen. Okay, well then just click through the slides on the side. That doesn't mean. There are three people waiting to enter the room. If someone is the host. Now that worked for some reason. There's no reason, I don't have any explanation as to why that worked. Oh, By the way, can I interrupt with um, a couple of tiny Zoom stories? Am I allowed to do that? Yeah, right. right. One tiny, tiny Zoom story is the story of how Zoom was made which is it's just a horrible, horrible hack, which breaks a lot of security things inside um, browsers. And the person who did it used to work for WebEx and, and had this idea to create a hack and stole WebEx people and went off and created it. So it's a classic hack story. But the other little Zoom story that I wanted to say, this is a little cultural reference for you, is um, uh, the Aretha Franklin song, song Who's Zooming Whom? Have a read, uh, listen to it sometime and look up the what, Aretha. Aretha Franklin. Is that what I said? Yeah. Aretha Franklin, uh, who's Zoom and whom, and look up what Zooming means. Anyhow, we're going to go back to Zoom, having just cursed it. <laughs> that is, that's uh, not a very good thing to say. A anyway, so if, if the points that I just made matter, if uh, multiliteracy is var a variability and multimodality matter, uh, what grammar? Uh, here we go. I'm going to admit to people who are asking to come in. All right. So, um, okay, done. Sorry, don't worry. Now yeah. we're back to not moving. Now we're moving again. Uh, what, what grammar uh, is appropriate? Do we have the meta language for uh, engaging with multimodality and multiliteracies? And how do we pass meanings in the world? 
And we want to say to you that for us, uh, grammar and parsing has a very particular kind of meaning, not the traditional meaning about you know, standard uh, language and, and how you label language forms, but grammar for us is uh, after Michael Halliday and Rakaya Hassan, who were our teachers, uh, I did I sat in their classes, both with Michael and Rakaya. Rakaya uh, is a semiotician and Michael has uh, uh, introduced systemic functional linguistics in, into the world. Uh, so they influence very much our orientation to uh, what we're going to share with you today. And that is that grammar is a theory of human experience. So uh, in the context of the multi, uh, multimodality, multiliteracies and variability, uh, human, that is a description of how meaning is made in human experience and grammar has to be able to capture uh, that. So we're going to now, that's just a potted little introduction uh, to our most recent work, which is called a transpositional grammar. We've tried to come up with a meta language to address uh, that what I've just said about the shift in meaning making that has occurred, essentially because of the digital domain uh, to multimodality and to multiliteracy. So the first book, Making Sense, uh, which deals with uh, reference agency and structure, and the second book, Adding Sense, which deals with context and interest. Uh, in the Halladayan framework, reference agency and structure are the main uh, concepts and context and interest are ancillary, but for us, we make them of equal importance, as you'll see, as we describe them. So, um, we came up with a framework for parsing meaning making. Uh, at one end, we have uh, on one axis, the functions of uh, any particular kind of artifact or meaning making text. Uh, and on, uh, on the right, we have the forms in which they can happen. You'll notice here that we've separated text and speech because we think they're very far apart. Traditional grammar talks about uh, text being uh, a replication of speech, but we argue that that's not the case. They're very different kinds of modes. And of course, we added the body because uh, we, we look at each other. You see my arms are walk, uh, uh, moving around. The body as part of meaning making it, uh, is a very significant uh, mode as well. So this is the framework of meaning functions and meaning forms uh, that guide our... Can I just say something yeah. about that before we jump on? The reason why we separated text and speech is text is actually a form of image. We lay text out visually um, and we, we transmit it across, um, across space. Whereas speech irretrievably happens in time, it's closely related to sound and body. So in other words, in the terms of these modes, you could hardly get thing, two things more different than text and speech. And therefore, um, kind of way, um, our kind of dramatic move is to say, language is a deceptively not usable category because it aggregates two things which are so fundamentally different. Right. Okay, so... By the way, that's the sun reflecting off a, a table here <laughs> on my face. It's early in the morning here. So that's... It's right. good, not long after So Sunday. the forms of meaning that we have decided to uh, examine are, as listed earlier, text, image, space, object, body, sound, and speech. And you'll see as we move forward, we don't see these in oscillation, but things that interact with each other. And uh, what we want to do uh, through this tran uh, transpositional grammar is develop a common language, a common language, uh, to speak about all forms of meaning. Now, how more ambitious could you get than that, <laughs> right? Because you know, our traditional grammars, you know, were about language, right, in a narrow sense, and as we said earlier, conflating speech uh, into a uh, uh, text. And we want to separate those things out, yet find a common meta language to be able to analyze and understand meaning in, in uh, its multiple forms. Here we go. Right, and in terms, uh, how do we do this? We ask five questions of meaning, uh, five questions about the functions of meaning. So whether it's in visual or textual or about the body, we say, what is this about? Uh, irrespective of, of, of the, uh, the mode. And so we look for the reference uh, in the architecture of whatever mode we're looking at. The second question we ask, 
who or what is doing whatever action uh, is involved in that particular uh, artifact. And, and we call this agency. What's the role of agency in meaning making in any kind of mode? And the third function is what holds the meaning together? That is, how is the artifact or the uh, mode uh, in which the meaning is made structured in order to hold meaning together? And the fourth question is, what else is the meaning made in that artifact connected to? That is, what's its context that gives it its particular meaning? And the last question, which is very, very important for us, is what's it for? Whose interest does the artifact that, that's holding the meaning or the mode, whose interest does it serve? I mean, you can call it ideology, you can call it any other number of things, but these are the five functions of meaning that we believe you can ask of any mode uh, in order to parse it for its meaning. Great. So I have... Uh, Now, uh, this is a terrible thing to show you, but this is the whole grammar. We're not going to go through the whole grammar. You can see um, uh, it has reference, agency, structure, context, and interest, and then the subcategories. What we're going to do is uh, just go into a few of them uh, to exemplify how we can use the grammar framework that we've presented uh, to uh, understand meaning making in its complexity and in its variability. Right, so transpositions. What, what, what are we meaning by this? We're meaning that, that transposition is about movement, that no meaning is ever fixed. It's shifting around all the time and that there are two vectors in the way that it shifts and in the way that we can parse it. So form to form, you know, uh, uh, it's, you can have something in an image, uh, you can have something in text, uh, it can be about the same thing, but there are shifts within the meaning and differences uh, that come, uh, that are specific to the mode. And in terms of function, we, we see transpositions between one function and another function, and the fact that they're all together, uh, as well as uh, focusing on one rather than the other. So, uh, making sense of the patterns of many. I'm going to give you a real simple example first, just to give you an overview of how this model might work. And then Bill will give you a detailed parsing of it. So, here is a picture of Big Yam Dreaming. It's a really magnificent, huge piece of work done by an Indigenous woman in her 90s, right? Um, Australian Indigenous An Australian Indigenous woman. And so, Here's the image, uh, it, that's the meaning form. How can we understand this meaning function? I can ask you, what do you see here? What is it that, that you see in this picture, right? Uh, but from, if we were to use our uh, five questions, we would say, well, what does it reference? Well, in this case, it references the yam, which is a, a kind of, uh, uh, it has a root system, the yam, and it, it references the land. It's a vine that grows across the ground. That's right. And the. Uh, which, which produces this fruit, which Indigenous people eat. Right. Yeah. Which sort of like a vegetable or fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's not just about the fruit, it's also about the person. It's about the artist herself. The yam is her totem. It's, it's about her as well. So the reference to be understood directly is not just about the vines, it's about the individual herself and how she presents herself. And then agency. In this particular image, the land speaks to the artist, right? And she then renders that speaking uh, in the work that's there. In terms of the structure, uh, oops, you've taken a spectrum. I didn't know that. What happened? Oh, first thing I All yeah. right. In terms of the structure, the shoots and the roots and the creeper, right? They are the, what happens in the desert and they represent. Uh, the language uh, of uh, the artist and her people, and uh, it, it's, it's set up in a way that speaks, right, to the, her living in her country. And what is the context? Of course, it is her country, but it's more than that. It's not just her country and her people. This is made for a gallery, right? So it's a, 
a mixture between the traditional and the modern, uh, and much more than that as well. And whose interest is it in? Of course, it expresses some part of that uh, traditional connection of the artist uh, to her heritage uh, and, her, and to her politics, but it also is something she does in order to make money. She needs to uh, be able to survive in her country and in her land by representing some of herself uh, to others. So we can use the five questions about meaning, about the functions of meaning against this image to get a rich understanding of this particular uh, work. Right, and I, I was just going to show you a picture of her country. This is the country. It's a very, very, uh, it's a, a, in Central Australia. Uh, it's a very dry country, a very beautiful country in a very stark kind of way. And uh, meaning making in the country is, in this country, is mostly through visuals. You can see the school there is completely covered with visuals and representation and meaning making through visuals dominates uh, uh, this uh, community uh, as much as RSC does and very little writing of course because uh, writing was not part of the traditional culture and as only recently the oral language has been translated into or, uh, or uh, transliterated rather into, into text. So the image speaks in a powerful way of uh, a very deep set of uh, issues related to the artist. Let's see if we can get on to the next one. Mm, it's too tricky. Right, so just for me to conclude uh, where we're getting to with our uh, transformational grammar. Uh, where we are arguing for an ontological term uh, with, uh, in, the t in understanding meaning making, and we have four proposals. And the first one I've already mentioned, how do we create a generalized grammar that works across all forms of meaning? We need to be able to do that if we're going to harness them effectively. And secondly, after the language turn, right, that's where we were, you know, um, uh, we advocate the ontological turn that is there is meaning in things and in what they do. And we need to uh, focus on that as well. And thirdly, uh, we describe the dynamics of movement within meaning, uh, which is just as important as uh, it perhaps more important than the sta static systems uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of grammar that we are used to using to describe meaning. And lastly, uh, we've, we've tried to deal with the tension between uh, materialism and idealism. And, and our uh, case is that they're not opposites, right? The ideal and the material, uh, you can move backwards and forwards between these two. And we'll give you some examples as we follow uh, about how these four proposals play out in our transformational grammar. Okay, so this is when we turn to me. And so that was Mary speaking in pretty um, uh, you know, synoptic terms about the overall schema. I'm going to get concrete now and give some examples. Um, so, um, and I'm going to go into each of the five functions and give one example of a transposition in each area, right? So an instance is a single thing. Mary is a single, a singular person who has a name, which we give a proper noun to give her a name. So this is in, um, and this is in reference. So in referring to the person Mary, um, she is an instance of a, of, of a concept, which is a person. She's a person, and that person, her person could be categorized in a whole lot of ways, as a woman, as a professor, as whatever. Um, but those are um, things which are singular in the world and things which are concepts. This is the idea that we're working on. So in static structuralist grammar, the way we dealt with this is singulars and plurals. Right? Um, 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 and an image, what we do, is often we have realistic pictures of, of something which is absolutely singular or iconic pictures which represent concepts. So our idea is that we want to, instead of using, um, we want to have a terminology that can describe both text and image. Um, so, and what Mary and I have done in these two books is we're actually historians by training is we've all the time 
tries to go back to the root of things, to the heart of things, the beginnings of things. And one of the, um, uh, or two actually, of the most powerful people, the most important people in the invention of modern visual and conceptualization, the dealing, dealing with plurals and images, if you like, if you want to use a language term, um, was Otto Neurath and Marie Reitermeister, who established in the 1920s the Museum of Economy, of Society and Economy in Vienna. And this is a photograph of Otto Neurath. Again, I, I want to focus on the singularity of this artifact. Um, it was taken um, when he was involved in the, um, the Bavarian Soviet of uh, 1919, taken in 1919. And it happens that the photographer who took the image uh, became Hitler's, Adolf Hitler's sole photographer or, or preferred photographer, only official photographer. Um, and here it was taken during the Bavarian Revolution. Later on, this particular image is labelled the Jew Neurath. So there's something deeply singular about Neurath um, in this, this category. But this is the iconography that was, was constructed in this space. So these are these incredibly beautiful visuals which we now recognise um, as multiplicity. So when you're walking through an airport and you see an aeroplane symbol or a person, person symbol, which is the bathrooms, um, that these are about concepts which may be instantiated. And this is a visual play um, in terms of building this instant concept distinction. So th these, um, and um, the, actually the person who actually drew the drawings was a modernist artist by the name of Ger uh, Gerhard Arndt as well. So what we have in the world today, which is kind of interesting, I'm going to jump to the digital world now, is we have a world of incredible instantiations, a lot of which are in this form. So on the left, we have here a bag going through um, the airport, which is given a long number and it's got a barcode, which is practically not memorable. So the world of um, proper nouns um, in the digital world has become incredibly pro precisely sp um, specified. So Mary Calancis, we can call a proper noun, but in fact, there's more than one Mary Calancis in the world. And to identify her specifically, we need um, other identifiers, driver's license numbers. Actually, we have unique identifiers, which is how we really count, which is an email address, a unique identifier. Um, a, uh, a cell phone number is a unique identifier. So this is actually grammatically in the digital world, a process that we call instantiation. And what's interesting, and this is our argument about the separation of speech and, and um, text, is in the digital world, a lot of these things become unspeakable, right? So in fact, I can't remember my driver's license number and I can't remember my passport number. Um, by speakable, we mean things that you can actually stay in, in, in oral conversation. Reading a text, which is me reading out my passport number to write it on a form, um, is not actually oral in the sense that I'm actually um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm, I've got to read to write uh, to get that. So what's interesting about this world is that the, in the digital world, text has become even more different um, by virtue of this naming. And by the way, in our definition of text, we include numbers. The number there, CAO95, when I get, if I've lost my bag, I can go and read the number out, but there's no way I can ever remember it for the purposes of speech. Then on the right, what we have is actually not an instance. Well, the picture is an instance, but actually it's a concept which is the barcode on the left, is for these chicken of the sea sardines, of which there might be tens of thousands of instantiations, which is the particular sardine can that I take to the, um, uh, that I take to the, uh, the checkout. So what we have is these systems of uh, conceptualization of stuff in the world. But in fact, what's interesting is this, um, this, this naming of this concept, which is otherwise known as a product, in this product naming system. And it's unique, the product is uniquely named. So we have these elaborate systems where sardine is a type of food and a supermarket is a type of place where it's kept. And so we build these elaborate taxonomies where these nameable concepts are then kind of instantiated. When I get to the checkout, um, it's a single instantiation of this particular chicken of the sea. And occasionally what we do, if something's particularly valuable, we put a serial number on, which is instantiation. My mobile phone has a serial number, which means that it's not a, not a good idea to steal it. Um, do you, uh, I was just saying, go back to the uh, first slide. Yeah. Yeah. Back, 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 back. 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 here. Right. So, so uh, this is the contrast that we uh, Bill made initially about our transpositional grammar, 
uh, there's most, more specificity uh, around the uh, example of what the reference is if we talk about in, in, instance and concept uh, rather than in singulars and plural, because this world uh, uh, allows for the transposability of very unique and very complex uh, uh, realities uh, in the different modes. And the transposability is Mary is both an instance and, is, and can be considered as a, a conceptualization. Her person, her name, her picture, um, and so on, because she might be statistically in this picture, and that's the way we would conceptualize her if she was a child getting um, a school meal in, the, uh, in Vienna in the 1920s. Um, and of course, what we have out there in the world is, um, I kind of, kind of like this, I found this image on the web, um, is this world of, you know, every single web page actually has a number. We have this world of deep instantiation that's going on. And in fact, the numbers are so um, unreadable, unspeakable that we give them um, um, URLs, which become relatively memorable, but by the time you're into Facebook, they're not at all memorable. You just have to copy and paste them. This is text. These are new text practices, which are kind of interesting. So that's one example. Back to reference. Next example, back to reference. I'm still in reference. I'm going to give another so we example. We did instance. We did instance con the concept. And by the way, we're, I'm only doing selected transpositions. Yeah. But actually, the, the point is about these things being simultaneous and movable, right? That um, Mary is always ready to be a person, right? And personhood is always ready to be instantiated as Mary, <laughs> right? And we can move backwards and forwards. It's about movement. So classic structuralisms are about, and in fact, the image here that we've got looks like a structuralism that we put things in their little spots in the taxonomy. But we're actually trying to subvert this image by saying it's actually about constant movement. These things are always being moved. So entity in action. Well, look, nouns and verbs. Nouns are entities, verbs are actions. And how do we do that in pictures? Well, in pictures we have objects and we can also have vectors. You know, if it's a moving image, we can see something moving. If it's a still image, we can project a vector in terms of, um, of, of its movement. So what we want to do is, we, Part of this is giving, uh, building a language which can cross, right. in this case, um, uh, text and image um, to describe this, this, um, these distinctions. So I'm going to give a few examples now. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm going back to here. I'm letting people into the room, by the way, which is why I'm getting <laughs> into um, trouble here. So, in fact, as I said, Barry and I are historians, we're interested in the beginnings of things, where things come from. Um, one of the, 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 the people who begins building modern discourse in a profound kind of way is Isaac Newton. Um, and one of his, um, well, interestingly, by the way, this is off on a bit of a tangent, which we cover in the book. He also built crazy numbers. Like he spent, yeah, of the 8 million words that he wrote, 6 million were about the numbers in the book of Revelation and the end of the world and crazy. He was an alchemist and he was a nutter as well. But it doesn't matter. This was a moment of brilliance when he actually um, uh, discovered the refraction, the spectral decomposition of light um, by in its refraction into colors. But what's interesting in this particular quote here from uh, Newton's optics is the way in which uh, things that are happening become ob uh, objects, uh, entities, um, actions become objects. So every action can be objectified, every object can actually be, uh, the, the, the provenance of every, every uh, object can be reconstructed as an action, right? And what he does, and the classic scientific move, and um, by the way, Michael Halliday wrote a whole book about this, is to nominalize, right. which is to turn the, uh, what science does, it turns the actions of the world into these objective wow. things. So there's a linguistic game going on in here. But what's remarkable about the optics book is that Newton also does this in image. So you can see here, this is the spectral decomposition of light, where these images not only show objects spatially arrayed on the page, but movement via arrows and you know the light starts on one side and goes to the other. So what he's doing is both in text and image, what he's doing is he's um, doing this transposition between um, uh, entity and object, but one that actually um, prioritizes in the mode of Western science, prioritizes prior prioritizes object over action. Right. That's one of the classic scientific so moves. So it's the same, same topic, but with uh, different features in the mode as they right. use back and But forward. what it means is that then the, 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 the characteristic move between entity and action becomes the characteristic processes of Western science. Right. Moving a long way forward now, um, uh, in software programming, um, there's, um, this is used 
very largely by developers. Um, I think uh, a, a modeling um, language called Unified Modeling Language. And what it's about, and this happens to be a model here that's being built of a ticketing system for a theater. So the customer wants to make a reservation in a subscription series to go to a show and there's a performance. So we have a number of entities there, the customer, the show, the subscription series, the performance, but each of those things, the customer can, can become someone who actively is in the theater. The show is actually both a thing, but also an action. So it's about the, this is a kind of a, a, a digital mapping, if you like, of the, this grammar, this entity to action grammar um, written in uh, unified modeling language. Now, we're now moving the second exam. The second area is agency. I'm going to give just one example from agency. The book is full of examples, by the way. So part of um, and the website and the website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got a website as well where, where we don't have any pictures in the book because there were so many we can put them in. And yeah, um, anyhow, there's a website as well. Um, and I'm just giving a few examples from here. So this is about self and other, right? And what we do is that we think, okay, there's the first person, I. And there's the second person, you, right? And these things are distinct. So in structural um, setups, we say the difference between I and you is the structure. And the difference, which is never the twain shall meet, because I is utterly different from you, um, is actually the definition of each other. That's structuralism for you. Right. Um, but what we're going to say in transpositional grammar is that myself is your other. And um, um, I'm the same self in each case, but the meaning is different according to role. We're moving backwards and forwards between these. And if I'm feeling empathetic, I actually become you for a second in terms of my emotional uh, space or my feeling as a body. So in other words, self and other are not so hugely distinct. The great philosopher of this and the great theorist of this is a hugely forgotten and neglected woman, Edith Stein, who in fact, you know, um, was a student of Edmund Husserl, the inventor of, or the creator of phenomenology, um, in a way the last person in a tradition of phenomenology that was um, initiated in the West by, uh, by Hegel. Um, and um, she um, uh, did her dissertation called The Problem of Empathy, which is about exactly this problem, how you can feel the pain of others. And when you feel the pain of others, you are in some senses rebuilding the other. It's not the other. So transposition is about not about translation or transliteration or things being the same it's nothing like the same but you are making a move which takes you in that direction you're moving backwards and forwards between these things now um this is um uh, i want to give you a modern version of this and again the, 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 the deep complexity of this Rizzoli is a very fancy new york um art publisher you may or may not know um uh, Rizzoli. um, um and uh, kim kardashian west um, produced, um, or they published a book of her Instagram photos called Very Cleverly and Insightfully Selfish. So when you're taking a selfie, and selfie is a wonderful word, by the way, the etymology of the word, this is historical trivia is Australian. So um, <laughs> that's just uh, completely irrelevant to a sensible argument. Anyhow, um, um, uh, selfish is really brilliant because, you know, this holding the camera out to take a selfie, it is the self. But it's an externalization of the self. And when somebody else sees it, it's not, it's their self, not yourself, right? And also, you know, when you're doing that, the other person who's on Instagram is, for the moment, positioning themselves as if they were you or you were that camera um, looking at you in the other place. It's complicated. In other words, it's not a straightforward um, separation between self and other. Now, so. Um, certainly in her case, it was selfish from beginning to end. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you know, so it's both self and selfish. <laughs> um, yeah. So in other words, the, the point we're making here is that, you know, what we say in language is this first person, and there's, um, uh, you know, second person, you know, I and you, but in fact, it ain't that clear, but also we can do I and you and images in the way that people do in, um, you know, with selfies in Instagram and social media and wherever. All right, moving on to the third one now, and I'm just giving structure. one little example, the, th the third of our functions, um, is that we talk about material structures and ideal structures, the relationship between the two. Um, so in, in structuralist grammars, we have materialist systems. So B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist, his um, magnum opus for his life is a book called Language. Um, and in fact, um, one of the, the tragedies of life, I mean, he's a very problematic, complicated person, um, is that, uh, the first review by Noam Chomsky demolished the book and demolished behaviorism as a, as a reality. He didn't um, go away, though. 
it didn't go away. It didn't go away. But nevertheless, you know, um, um, this great book that he'd been working on for decades, um, Chomsky demolished in five minutes. And in a way, it's another whole argument, not entirely fairly either. Um, whereas idealist systems, which are saying that there are, you know, in the structures of our language, the structures of our ideas um, um, are things where the world is formed, of which Kant and Descartes, the Descartes are classical examples in the Western philosophical tradition. And Chomsky does that in ling linguistics, because he says, look, you know, the only things we mean are things which are hardwired into our brains as language, right. and nothing else is meanable. So what we say, whereas, whereas what Skinner was saying was it's the behaviours of the world which form our language. Right, right. And neither of them survived intact. No, no, neither Chomsky nor Skinner are surviving, I don't think. So, but what we, what we want to argue is um, that meaning is a play between the material and the ideal, whether one can see the other. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, here is Lewis Carroll's um, uh, Alice in Wonderland, who's just a, a remarkably wonderful modern person because what she does is she goes into the world and discovers things things which are unimaginable things which are strange things which the world where the world speaks to her but also she's a girl who's able to imagine to actually go beyond the material materialities of the world um, so she's both sensing the world as a set of material realities but imagining uh, well, what does that mean and taking things a little bit further um, one of the great, I mean, Deleuze, who's a problematic person, and our relationship to Deleuze is pretty complicated. Um, but nevertheless, one of uh, Deleuze is also a Alice <laughs> enthusiast, as we are. Um, um, and he parses Humpty Dumpty, um, where where you know Humpty Dumpty doesn't have <laughs> is both a material and an immaterial person in in um, in um, or character in. In Alice. And the blurring of the two is a continuous yes. uh, effect. Here's another lovely Alice image. This is Salvador Dali, and there's Alice down the bottom with her skipping rope. And the insanity of the, the queens who are doing funny things with each other, and so on. But I want to make a big jump from, from that. Um, and I'm going to go to some work that Mary and I are now doing in medicine. So I'm going from um, Alice and this, this play of the material and the ideal, and I'm going to give an example here. Um, around medical ontologies. So one of the things, and so this for us, the business of the play and the material is the business of something that we call ontology. What structures of meaning are imminent in the material world and discoverable? And what structures of meaning can we imagine and create and try to apply to the material world? And that either there's gotta be a connection between the two and the one can exceed the other. So on the, on the left here is a student at our university who's actually doing a case study of diabetes. Um, and this is a tool, an ontology building tool that Mary and I have been building with some developers here and some people in computer science at the university, where in fact we can specify what's going on in terms of these elaborate structures of meaning which have been built in the world around medical schemas, types of disease. The biggest one is the International Classification of Diseases, which has sort of been around since Florence Nightingale. But now these are all digital ontologies whereby, again, getting back to our conceptualization, we can conceptualize medical conditions and find them in instances, right? And we do that by this play of material and the, the ideal. So what we might do in this process is that we might find things which are undiscovered in the material. You know, we're living in this COVID crisis at the moment, there's a whole lot of things we don't know about it, but the meanings of that darn virus are actually being realized every day in our bodies even if we don't know what the meanings are in them yet, and we're working on it and we're finding stuff out and whatever. And we um, keep contributing we're finding to the new things. But the thing is, the meanings are actually in those material things. They're in our bodies. They're in things that are affecting us. And the undiscovered is something that we can then conceptualize. We can then build, we can then perhaps find something new and throw it in the ontology. COVID-19 might have been something which fitted very neatly and we've got to reconstruct our conceptualization of the world. But also what we can do is we can find potentialities in the ideal. Um, the best example in recent times is, you know, the Higgs boson event, which is now a material thing because somebody found the darn particle, but for a whole long time, it was just a theory where we imagined the possibility of it, right? So in other words, the ideal can exceed the material. Um, so this is again, a fundamental aspect of meaning and, um, uh, and between Alice and medical ontologies, we can see it happening. Uh, context. Context, number four. Um, and I think I'm doing reasonably well in terms of time. So, um, 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 again, this is our kind of theory of context. 
Um, and one of the aspects of context that we're talking about is, um, is something that we call participation, the way in which we participate in meanings. This is a contextual thing. This is um, you know, the role of, of players in this process. Just do two. I'm just going to do um, representation and communication, the connection between representation, transposition, which is there's actually, these things are different, um, but they easily, the one necessarily becomes the other. And in fact, what we argue is the one is always begging to become the other. Nothing stable, it's about to become the other. So I'm going to define what those two things are in a second. But firstly, the context idea in Halliday and for us comes from Malinowski. This is this quite a marvelous image of the white anthropologist with the Trobian Islanders. And what he said was the, the meaning's in the boat, the meaning's in the sea. What people say about these things um, is, is only comprehensible contextually in terms of the whole of these people's, what he called context of situation, which then becomes a key idea for Halliday in the Halliday grammar. Now, the thing is, in the Halliday grammar, context sits outside the meaning, around the meaning. For us, context is one of the deeply important and integral aspects. So, um, 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 in static structuralist grammars, often there's not a distinction between representation and communication, um, which, and I'm going to define those now, um, which uh, become um, uh, uh, you know, language centric views. But what we have here with inner speech, inner speech is talking to yourself eventually, you know, um, and I'm using the, the Vygotsky concept of inner speech, but also um, Colin McGee's notion of mind sight. There's a, a wonderful book by Colin McGee called um, uh, Mind Sight, um, uh, which is I can, in my mind's eye, visualize something, right? Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you to visualize something in a second. But before I do that, um, what I want to do is I want to say, look, this is the distinction. Representation is stuff which is meanings to myself and communication is meanings for others. And those two things are radically different from each other. And the question is what I do in every act of participation in meaning is I do some representation of my own, which may never get beyond that. I may never communicate it, or it may be something that somebody notices without me meaning to have communicated it which is they notice my body language or they you know, read a note that I've written to myself or something or other. Whereas communication is this framing of meaning, but the meaning is never one of transmission. Um, it's one of interpretation where the meaning is never the same. Right. So actually Mary and I in the book, um, we argue with one of your Italian greats, Umberto Eco here, who, um, who considers, he effectively considers failures to communicate as or, or, or non-communication or um, as um, as kind of aberrations in the communication process, the meaning process. But what we say is that's normal. What's normal is the fact that you are always reinterpreting something, reframing something, and it's never what I communicate. It's it's got a provenance, a connection to what I've communicated, but there's been a transposition. So we've got this transposition, representation, communication, interpretation. Part of the problem of contemporary politics. Yeah, oh yeah, don't mention <laughs> contemporary politics. Okay, so let me just get on to the next slide now. And for some reason, we're coming again. There we go. So this is Vygotsky's inner speech. And one of the, the incredible things about the Vygotsky inner speech um, uh, concept is that what, um, you know, small children talk out loud to themselves. But by the time they move to inner speech, they're saying something which is actually more different from externalized speech. It's not explicit because it relies more on context. Um, it's, it's predicates without subjects. The only reason why I need a subject on a sentence is so you, I, I reference you to what I'm talking about. But when I'm, when I'm talking to myself, all I need is a predicate, right? So in other words, what Vygotsky does, which is absolutely brilliant, is talk about the radical differences between representation and communication. But of course, there's a lineage. But when we move from representation to communication, um, there's, a, there's a shift going on. It's the same thing we're meaning, but we're meaning in a different way, and the meaning then becomes somewhat different in the process. For each person. Now, um, what I, if I said to you now, Eiffel Tower, right, um, you would conjure up in your minds an image of the, uh, the Eiffel Tower. And it almost certainly wouldn't be this one. This is a picture, in fact, that, um, that I took a whole, whole, whole lot of years ago. Um, and it was on a foggy day. You probably didn't think of that. And it doesn't have a hundred years celebration of the Eiffel Tower up the, up the thing. And it wasn't through in the winter with leaves. So what happens is that, that in the world of, um, uh, of, of uh, mental representation of things that are not with you, 
Um, these are very different from my communication of this with an image where you might be able to see particular struts in the tower, which in a, a mental image you don't. So again, the equivalent in image of uh, the move, Vygotsky's move from inner speech to, to um, outward, you know, sort of explicit speech, an image is the difference between mind sight, which is mental images and uh, um, actual visual images, which might be actually seeing the Eiffel Tower, or it might be my picture of the Eiffel Tower. So the, that, that's the parallel between the two and the reason why we want to apply this, these ideas of representation and communication across different modes. So, um, and lastly, lastly now, last example, so we're kind of, um, then, then we're done, um, is that interest is a kind of a theory of the purposes of things in the world, if you like, which is things don't exist. Um, you know, I do things for a reason, even if it's a casual reason or a thoughtless reason, or there's always reasons and things, and there's reason, you know, there's kind of meanings which express various forms of interest. So why are we doing this? We want to blow your mind about traditional static grammars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, by the way, this is, this is our rhetorical attempt, intent. But I want to draw the distinction here between what we call... And um, you will be either resisting or following or curious because no matter what we want to do, uh, what you want is going to be in uh, perhaps alignment or opposition or, or might shift over the hour that we're together. <laughs> So, um, uh, what we have is formal formalities of rhetoric, and again, your great Italian, Umberto Eco, um, is one of the, the people who kind of theorised this as a communicative practice, but again, we think his huge bias was towards communication, as opposed to, um, so rhetoric is absolutely a communicative game where I'm trying to convince you of something, but um, what we're interested in here is the interplay and the movement between rhetoric and something we call reification. So this is absolute rhetoric, um, and it's rhetoric, complicated rhetoric. Um, it's just a, a nice quote we like from uh, Andy Warhol, who saw this ad um, for a water heater and turned it into a work of art. So it's rhetoric on a number of layers. It's rhetoric um, in terms of him taking something vernacular and deeply ordinary, which is this sign, um, and then reflecting on it as, as a rhetorical piece all of its own. And here's another example. I'm going to move now to... Um, uh, Walter Benjamin and uh, the Paris Arcade. So the examples I'm going to give now are essentially about, about, about shopping. So here we've got walking down an arcade um, and there are two things happening. One is there are signs outside the arcade. This is the price, this is the whatever. But also what we have in the window is we have commodities where the meaning is in the object. The meaning, the meaning is partly framed by the space, the meaning is in the object. So we have rhetorical things in the forms of the signs in the arcade and these were the Paris Arcades that um, uh, Benjamin was talking about from the 19th century, which by the time Benjamin was writing and Jermaine Krall, his friend and colleague, was photographing them, were looking pretty run down. Now this is um, the meaning of a shopping centre. And again, we have a, um, a piece in uh, the, the book about this. In fact, while Otto Neurath was doing his stuff in Vienna, another Viennese person uh, by the name of Victor Gruen, um, was um, an architect there, and they all had to leave, of course, when the, the fascists came to power. And Gruen comes to the United States and becomes the inventor or the creator of the modern idea of a shopping centre. And in fact, the photo on the right is the world's first enclosed shopping centre from the 1950s. Um, and this is a pilgrimage that Mary and I took. I mean, I'm an anti-shopping person, but I <laughs> had to take a pilgrimage to, um, to, um, to Gruen's shopping centre where in fact what happens is the spatial framing of public and, uh, spaces and commercial spaces, um, the objects that are in the window. In other words, the meanings are actually in spatial configurations which are not rhetorical. They're actually reified. They're actually built into the objects themselves. Um, um, so what we have in the Internet of Things, jumping onto the digital world now, is we might have these RFID chips um, in things. We might have scannable codes. We might have... Um, AR, VR, which is able to detect what things are. We might have QR codes or whatever. So what we've got is we've got meanings in things themselves before they necessarily become textual meanings and before they become meanings where we need to argue for them explicitly, otherwise known as rhetoric. And we live in this world of imminent calculation of you know, the meaning of me moving through the door in terms of a um, you know, Fitbits and all that kind of stuff. So we've got all these things which are meanings in objects, reified meanings, before they become things we need to 
argue, speak, speak to explicitly, if you like. But what we do is we might want to sell this door opener, right? In which case we turn it into a rhetorical object, something we, we say, look, it'll give you greater security in your house, it'll do this and do that. And we might want to turn it into something where we argue for it, where we explicitly expose its interest. And our point vis-a-vis -vis ratification and rhetoric is the difference and the movement between explicit expressions of interest, rhetoric, and implicit interests built into things and into texts and into images and into everything else. So here we've got this um, world where, <laughs> you know, these meanings are being picked up all the time um, and so on. Um, and here we have Google. This was a, a long story, but um, these are all these kind of crazy over the top neural translation machines where Big Brother is watching us all the time because these meanings are being read and recorded, meanings in things um, um, uh, which become deeply powerful in this world of internet things uh, and the like. So that, that's kind of the end now. Um, this is the website. So the books there, there, there are the two covers. Um, this is our website, meaningpatterns.net, and, and we've got lots and lots of images there, hundreds and hundreds of images, in fact, um, um, because there were too many to put in the book, like I said. And the final thing is we also, um, the platform that Mary, or we mentioned before that we've built, which is kind of, we call a social knowledge platform, Common Ground Scholar, cgscholar.com. Uh, we have a community in there where we post regular extracts from these books. Um, 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 so you can go and create an account and join that community. Uh, but we're also on Facebook and Twitter if you want um, small doses of this as we go. We go back to the four propositions. So um, I was going to say audacious. What we're trying to do, I suppose, is, is audacious. You know, we are uh, linguists um, uh, trying to open up uh, the tools for meaning making because the world that we live in today is completely saturated by the digital in almost all the domains, private and public. And we have to be able to uh, parse that as much as we parse uh, traditional alphabetic text. I give one very crude example of the shift. Uh, you all know the um, uh, prison at Abu Ghraib. You know, uh, it, uh, the Red Cross had gone there and taken and written uh, a perfectly uh, uh, elaborate text, you know, in English and put it on the web about what was going on in that prison, right? And it was available for politicians, for lawyers, for citizens to read uh, freely. However, it had no effect. Somebody went in there with a camera and took a picture of the man with the hood, remember, with all the wires coming off, and instantly that had a powerful effect on the imagination of ordinary people as well as politicians and the law. So these modes uh, the, 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 that we are talking about are having powerful effects in ways that before only the written form had. So we need to understand uh, these and we do not believe anymore that the category language or the traditional grammars that we have uh, you know, we can spend hours and hours with learners teaching them uh, to parse with, you know, the traditional grammar forms, uh, but it won't prepare them to deal for a world that is becoming uh, more uh, um, uh, differentiated, not less differentiated, more uh, uh, issues are becoming more contested, not less con uh, contest contested. We need, and, and more uh, movement uh, backwards and forwards uh, between the ways we understand the world. So these four things that we've tried to do uh, is what we've tried to share with you in, in, in a very quick kind of way. You know, what a generalized grammar might look like across all those forms, uh, how we move to an ontological term rather than the language term. We don't think that that is uh, what's needed anymore. And thirdly, without being schizophrenic, <laughs> uh, how do we understand the movement of meaning backwards and forwards? How do, of course, movement has to be stabilized, uh, meaning has to be stabilized in order to be meaning, but how do we understand the way it shifts all the time between uh, participants? And in the end, how do we understand the relationship between what we think is ideal and the material? And how does the material reality uh, uh, in, impact the ideal? And what kind of imagination can we have that might take us uh, to another 
a place where the world might be more inclusive and that there might be more uh, communication that is uh, of a positive form rather than a negative form. So, uh, that in a nutshell, <laughs> uh, that's what we've tried to share with you uh, this morning at our end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank we you. don't hear you. Um, Marina? Thank you, why don't, why don't thank you very you? much. Thank oh, yeah, that, that's good. You, you can hear me now. Um, yes, we can. Thanks a lot. I, um, I, I'd just like to open the floor to questions from students. If they can either write questions or and colleagues, um, they can either write questions on the chat or they can take the word and um, and Lisa will mm -hmm, keep track of, of, of questions. So you can you can actually write your questions uh, in the Q and A section. Maybe I'll I'll just start with a comment and. Uh, Students might need to <laughs> take some time to write that they can speak to. Um, now, one is a very wide question. It's probably more of a comment than a question. And that is, um, I, I, what I really appreciate in your uh, view is this attempt to create a terminology that works first for language analysis and for the analysis of visual text. Um, what I, I, I'd like to hear from you is perhaps uh, something more, if you could elaborate on uh, how the two, in a way, integrate, because uh, I can see that we can use the same category for the two aspects, but in a lot of texts nowadays, it's not just image and not just text or speech, it's, it's a mixture of everything, <laughs> and it's this multi um, so that th this is one thing i'll i'll allow the second question and then perhaps i'll, I'll leave the floor one at a time so we don't forget them. the reason why we put the two together is they do the same thing but they also do different things they they complement each other so the image adds something to the text and the text adds something to the image and the reason why we put them together is for that reason so um yeah but uh, we have a grid which I haven't, uh, I think I only showed you in the first form where the five questions, uh, you know, the five functions against the modes, right? Uh, but of course, meaning is never, is sometimes in multiple modes, right? Not just one mode, and that particularly now on the, uh, in the digital environment. But nonetheless, those five questions and their subcomponents, right, in the grammar that we've uh, produced, uh, is a way to parse that meaning, right? So you can use the same questions, right, to parse uh, uh, text, image, body, etc., uh, both in their singularity and both in their multiplicity, right? So it's those key questions, right, which come we, uh, from the Halliday and uh, Systemic Functional Linguistics Grammar, but as we said, we included context and interests because we think they're equally important as reference agency and structure, right? Uh, so we the framework is uh, is there, and I think I gave you the little example with how you might use it with a yam picture, right? But you could take any 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 um, multimodal uh, composition or any uh, com uh, or any artifact in any mode and ask those five questions, right? And you will have a more complete understanding of the meaning uh, than if you just said, well, there it has clauses, uh, you know, there's subject and object, it has nouns and verbs, it has, you know, uh, right? So what, what, do, what does a traditional grammar give you? It doesn't really give you meaning, does it, right? Uh, it gives you labels for uh, particular uh, um, uh, realize, uh, representations, right? And we want to get to meaning, what meaning is, right? Uh, and, and meaning needs to ask those five questions always of, uh, in any mode. So that's what we've contributed. But of course, we have 
in, in writing the book, the books, which took four years, we have established uh, a set of uh, criteria, you know, against those five questions, which go deeper than just the five questions. Now, we're presenting it to you, um, and it's novel. I mean, it doesn't have, a, you know, where it's, uh, what can I say? It's an innovation uh, that we have thrown into the linguistic world. Um, there are precedents for it because other linguists have talked about, uh, like uh, Gunter Press and others, about the movement of meaning, right? And many have talked about multimodality, but we haven't had a coherent grammar for parsing it. And uh, that's what we've tried to offer you. And then to show you the examples of from the range of philosophers and theorists and uh, linguists that informed uh, the macro design that we put forward. Marina, does that help? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, please. Uh, there's, I noticed a question in the chat, but we can, we can come back to that or Marina, you had a second question or someone else had a question? I, I did, there, there's, well, I, I can probably throw it in because I think it's related to the next one. I just thought, um, I, I, I would have liked you to elaborate a bit on the notion of the ontological term. But I see that the next question is all yeah, on yes. the medical. I, I thought that was a very intriguing uh, bit. So perhaps you can add a bit more on the term to the next question, which I think Annalise is going to read. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, Oh, go on. The ontological term. I've got to remember these things. Go on, Annalisa. <laughs> okay. Uh, could you please explain a bit more the part of medical ontologies where you said that we can discover meaning patterns in real world? Okay. Right. So um, I'll explain that. Um, so maybe what I might, I might answer the ontolo ontological term first. Right. So. Here we have Chomsky who says that meaning is all in language and language is hardwired into our brain and therefore we kind of project these meanings onto the world uh, via the language that, that we use. Um, and what we had in the 20th century is the language term which said everything, you know, the, the way we think, the way we understand the world is framed by language. Well, what this leaves out, it leaves out sight, it leaves out meanings in objects, it mean, leaves out meanings in bodies and gestures. It leaves a lot of stuff out to say, to prioritize language like this. Um, so what we say and is- And the idea of grammar as a philosophy of life. Right? So, um, so what we say about the ontological term is that in fact, ontologies are, is being, right? What are the meanings in the world, right? And we might express those meanings in image, we might express them in speech and text and, and, and whatever. Um, but what we do, by the way, all those meanings are not just this abstract thing that you can put into grammar trees, which is what uh, Chomsky does. They're actually materialized, you know what I mean? And the materialization of meaning in text is a very different process from the materialization of meaning in speech, right? Um, yes, of course there are connections, and we call that a transposition. Of course, you, you go from one to the other, but when you do, it's something quite different. You know, in text, you're arraying something visually on a page. So we're interested in these very, very material practices of literally making meaning, literally manufacturing meaning, literally creating meaning, which we also do, by the way, with digital cameras and pixels and, um, and, and all manner of things in the digital world, which are kind of, um, um, uh, you know, characteristics of our, our times. So that's what we mean by ontological, which are, there are meanings in things, there are meanings in, um, you know, in, in a cup, in, in our bodies, in what we do, in the world itself. Um, and we move backwards and forwards between these um, meanings and when we use even things like speech and language, their material artifacts, the material artifacts affect the way they move. That's what we mean by that. Um, now with the thing about medical ontologies, um, what we do is we have bodies that have conditions, right, which we might call medicine, um, um, some of which we don't know and we don't understand and are yet to be found out, right? And they are, if you like, kind of meanings in our bodies because they play through this into the action thing. They play through as in the case of illness, they play through as disease, they play through as whatever. They're active things that have an effect on us 
and they actually mean something in a number of ways, even though we don't necessarily have a way to articulate that, understand that, and what the ideal is then is trying to conceptualise what the hell's going on, which is what's been happening in this COVID crisis, for example, what a strange damn illness this is, and how does it work, and, and you know, there's things being discovered every day. The other thing is that what we do is we build these kind of schemas which um, are both mental models of the world. So the thing about medical ontologies which are interesting are these highly specified descriptions of things that can happen to bodies. Um, and what they do is they allow us to find things, right? They actually mean that we figure things out um, and they then become discoverable. So it's a kind of play where it isn't that the material and the ideal match, they don't, they overlap, and you can push beyond um, the material into the ideal in order to try to imagine what might be going on, to project what might be going on. That's where you're pushing the ideal above the beyond the material. And there might be aspects of the material which you haven't quite seen or understood or, um, 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 uh, you know, with the, which then materialize. So that's our kind of, the, the, that's the explanation there which tries to explain that process. And, and if I can just say, in 1994, we started this journey and uh, said that multimodality and multiliteracies and variability was going to be the future, right? Uh, we were hoping that that would, somebody asked for videography, would encourage uh, linguists and scholars to take up uh, the challenge of a middle language that was able to cross uh, that variability and that multimodality. However, the context and the interest in our educational systems are so tied to traditional ways of doing things, you know, gold standards and, you know, uh, the uh, valuing of, of grammar and correctness and, you know, and, and main languages, uh, you know, that context and the interest supporting it are so great that despite the fact that the material world <laughs> is changing in the way that it's operating. Somebody asked what we do about education, uh, that we, we didn't rise to the challenge. And now, precipitously, here we are all thrown, right? Every educator in, in the world, as a consequence of the pandemic, has precipitously been thrown into the digital, into multimodality, and we're trying to sticky tape things together to, to get by hoping that we'll be able to return to the context and the interests of the past. But this is a, a, tra a powerful transitional moment. We didn't expect what has happened, none of us did, but we were thinking when we wrote this transformational, uh, transpositional grammar uh, that we must, we have to have uh, a grammar for passing meaning that looks at living right and the way in which living happens right uh, across those modes and so that's been our offering we don't know the strength of it we don't know how useful it'll be uh, we're glad that you wanted to hear it <laughs> uh, we are it's disruptive of course even though we uh, we say it's a continuity it is it is a continuity in some regard uh, but uh, it is a disruptive uh, um, thesis on what is required if we are generally going to harness multimodality and understand its meaning making. Of course, different disciplines like art or design and photography or architecture, you know, uh, did do uh, analysis of the visual or spatial in, in, in their own form, but we didn't um, take those, uh, uh, con well, we have in, in some way the, the concepts that developed in different disciplines in order to have a general understanding of meaning making that transcended any particular mode. So, so I just noticed another question there: meanings for education in the context of emergency remote education. Yeah, it's I mean, we, yeah. we, we we might be able to parse this space um, to use the, the word Mary and I use is parse, which is taking a, a linguistics word and applying it to right. to um, we might parse this Zoom space. So what we might do is we say, okay, what are we referring to? We're referring to semiotics and language. Um, uh, the agency question though is kind of really interesting, which is how does agency play out in this space, which is both similar and different from a traditional lecture theater or classroom, right? So right. there's a number of, of pieces of agency. So there's Marina uh, uh, agency in selecting us. <laughs> 
there's <laughs> our agency in uh, the kind of uh, presentation that we've given you, right? And there's your agency, right, in the way that you're receiving and internalizing or otherwise, right? So with agency, you know, we've got a classical, we've absolutely replicated the traditional way to here, here, which is one person's talking at a time. Um, there is a little bit of tiny disruption going on. We've got multimodality happening. People are typing here. And normally the lecturer at the front of the room couldn't see what you were typing. So we've got a little bit of that, which allows a little bit of multi-channeling. By the way, listening to a lecture is pretty darn boring in a regular lecture theater. Um, um, but this is a way to, um, uh, you know, to supplement a little bit you know, um, uh, in terms of, but, but essentially it's the same dialogical structure that, 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 that's going on. So one of the things is we've experienced both uh, a replication which fossilizes old forms. So in other words, the tiles I can see on the screen here um, are um, just like you were all sitting up in rows in a, in a classroom or a lecture theatre. You're all passive, you're all quiet, there isn't much agency going on. You're just sitting and listening to us while we, we talk which is, um, in terms of social media, it's pretty boring to be quite frank, it's low cognitive load. Um, so we've replicated that. We've done a few little things that are different. The other thing we've done, we could have probably recorded the live lecture, but we often didn't, but now it's so easy to press the record button, you do. So it can become asynchronous as well as synchronous. Um, so to actually compare the similarities and differences across those kind of forms of meaning, if you like, the lecture, compared to Zoom, we can ask those five questions. Now, the big question then is the interest question, which is how in this environment has the balance of agency between the lecturer or teacher and the student listener changed? And the answer is, I don't think it has much, to be quite frank. So in other words, if we regard traditional pedagogy as, um, well, traditional pedagogy in our kind of facetious view, of it, not facetious, serious view, to be quite frank, was also invented in Italy, by the way, by St. Benedict. Um, and who said it become the disciple to sit and listen, you know, um, I can't remember the whole quote now. The teacher um, speaks and the, the, and the disciple listens. That's right. <laughs> the, 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 you know, the modern monastic tradition created this strange discursive form of one person talking and everyone else behaving themselves and listening. I mean, nobody's putting comments down the side here and saying, oh, that's ridiculous. I don't, you know, blah, 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 blah. You're all being very, very um, well behaved. So in other words, we can say, we can parse this in terms of the balance of agency, which becomes the interest of classical modern pedagogy. So we can, we can do that. Um, so that's just a little example of how we might use these kind of tools to compare this Zoom screen. And by the way, some people just have their names, so we don't know, you'll probably scrolling through Facebook or doing something more interesting. Um, in a normal lecture theatre, we would have, well, I suppose you can scroll through Facebook in a normal lecture theatre as well. So in other words, um, you know, we can take apart what's going down here as, as a set of human relationships asking these, these questions. So the person who asked about education, what Bill just described is, yes, the digital has affordances, many affordances. However, the, what, what, when we choose Zoom, right, as Bill said, we're making a choice uh, to replicate what we're comfortable with, right? It's not, but it, it would be possible uh, to be able to engage uh, peer to peer to, but you couldn't do it in Zoom, right? You have to have a different platform that allows uh, much more engagement where we have a flipped classroom where you, you know, you get the lecture beforehand and then we come together and you talk to each other and that we recorded the, the responses and, and engage. It is possible to have a much more inclusive environment. However, the world has become Zoom because it's closest to what we're familiar with, right, in traditional classrooms. Um, and the, the, inter the interactive bibliography, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, our stuff's on the website and then in the stuff that we do, we cite a lot of other stuff. Yes. Um, so um, it's, um, meaningpatterns.net will get you to a home page where you can find a whole lot of stuff about e-learning and um, I can put it in the chat box if you like, I can type it in the chat box, which is one thing. Oh, I, I suppose if I was on a regular lecture here, I could put a witness on the board. So that's a little bit multimodal, isn't it? Isn't it? Sorry, that didn't turn out as you well, are. Well, we have some of you who are grad students. Uh, are adventurous enough uh, to uh, uh, go into a, a wider understanding of meaning making for the future and for your own times. 
and uh, perhaps to resist a little just to the reputation of what we've always done and to demand a different kind of more human, uh, engaging uh, environment, even uh, in, the, in these spaces. Any other questions? They're all comments? silent. <laughs> See, that's what happens in these spaces. Yeah. <laughs> We've been writing about this, by the way, in the whole e-learning space, and you know, um, yeah, 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 about what are the problems with these e-learning spaces? They don't have to be like this. They could be, it could be different. It's Anyhow, the only thing it did do it give us gave us an opportunity to say um, in 40, 50 minutes what. In the book took us 700 pages and yeah. on the website takes us four, four or five hundred pictures and 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 how how do you uh deal with uh new knowledge it takes a long time to assimilate new knowledge i know we, we think education is always about new knowledge but we come in with our interests and we come in with our, our prejudices i mean we we uh teach uh online uh, doctoral students and one of the biggest problems we have is getting them to put their expertise to date outside of their thinking and to uh, engage in a journey of discovery. But they're always, you know, because they're scholars and because they're trained to be scholars and they've learned so much, they always want to put what they already know at the forefront of their work. And yet uh, a journey of discovery, particularly in these transitional times, needs for you to take risks, to be vulnerable, to be, you know, open-minded. Um, so uh, we understand uh, the dilemmas that students have who want to get through their qualifications and uh, uh, in the fastest possible way. <laughs> but don't be shy. <laughs> you are shy. <laughs> Perhaps I can answer for, for, for some of the Italian students. Italian students don't often ask too many questions, which doesn't mean that they're not thinking, but, oh, and that they yeah. haven't come up with their own silent questions, found some answers, other answers. Perhaps they'd be thinking, oh, I need to read that because <laughs> I, I've understood a third or a fourth of what they said. But I'm sure that um, certainly the um, and also, yes, the, the, the idea of uh, analysing life, as you said, yeah. <laughs> through the same uh, categories is certainly fascinating, but needs to sediment a bit. It, it's something that we all have to... Um, well, uh, I'm sure Italian uh, scholars like Greek ones, I'm a Greek background, uh, very uh, philosophical also in their orientation to the world. So they have to think deeply. Whereas in the American context, American students will give you a comment before you start talking. <laughs> <laughs> Not even bother with the question. <laughs> so yes, context is very different. <laughs> but it's something about the, uh, the, you know, about the world, these two different worlds. I mean, uh, America and Italy, even in the educational context, are very different. And you could pass them using those five questions. You know, very different, Arita. We're from Australia, right? And uh, coming to the American context, uh, we found it exceedingly different, right? As uh, to be teaching in this environment, uh, because uh, American students are very opinionated from both. <laughs> you know, it's encouraged. Uh, it's encouraged, you know, to choose what you wear, to choose where you go, choose what you eat, choose, you know, choose what you think, choose what you're prepared to be open to. And that is, uh, you know, deeply ingrained in the ideology and habits which flows all the way through. Uh, so uh, to be able to Pass meaning across all those questions matters. Like you can't get a proper meaning. It's not that uh, Italians and Australians and Americans and Greeks are genetically different. It's not. It's the context. It's the interest. It's the structure. It's how agency plays out. It's you know. It's how all these uh, functions of meaning making come together uh, to create certain ways of being in the world. So yeah, it's. Uh, interesting times that we're in now. 
thing. You've got five minutes. <laughs> Come up with questions or comments. Let's see some questions and more comments. Well, it's good, to, it's good to see that most of you have stayed the distance. That's a good, that's very good. <laughs> yeah. And there's Vincenzo with a hat and a gun and a yellow shirt. <laughs> that's a technician. <laughs> the technician. <laughs> oh, that's a technician. Oh, right, he needs a gun. <laughs> <laughs> he needs the anonymity. Armin Gento hidden behind. It's a strange message he's sending. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if you're in America, it's a scary message. <laughs> it? Yes, not these days, no. <laughs> oh. It's more of a, of a joke, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I suppose so. Uh -huh. So are you guys all doing well there where you are? I'll just ask that question. You're all safe and healthy and uh, not, you know, in here, in here, we, here in Urbana Champagne, you probably heard uh, our university was a, has uh, invented a swab. So all students get tested twice a week. All professors get tested every week. You can't go in unless your app shows that you're being tested. Very different way of living. Mind you, there's a lot of, a lot a lot of, of cases, cases here and a lot of yeah. deaths too. 30, so. it's, we had 40,000 students turn up, of course, for classes from all around America. Uh, the instance of, of the uh, disease is in that community really, really high. It's um, when it, it doesn't seem we're ever going to be going back to something. You know, we're not quite sure what the future is, but certainly. Um, it's a very weird, surreal time here. I don't know, you, are you guys are over the worst? Well, or getting back to the worst, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, we we're getting a bit worse now after a good summer, but for example, our university hasn't gone back to um, teaching in presence. I, I haven't seen the lot oh. for quite a while. <laughs> Tempted to say, oh, nice to see oh, you again oh. after the summer. Because it, oh, so you're, you're not teaching in person? No still. teaching in person at university level. Schools have gone back, but oh, Moderna uh, has left universities like this because we, we tend to have large groups. Right. Um, so we have a young, a young participant in Michael's little, little boy. Actually, one of the one of the nice things about Zoom is people's babies jumping on their laps and their dogs bark. So that's um, you know, there are a lot of horrible things about Zoom, but that's the nice thing. May so. the world get better for your little fella. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah. I got rid of my dog because otherwise <laughs> she's outside because otherwise she'd be here jumping on and looking well, at the screen. All of us being at home for work and for um, and for education does change the meaning of what we do. It really does. You know, we're all at home, right? Yes. And it puts us in a very different frame of mind. I did re read somewhere that there are now clothing advice for zoom <laughs> like before we used to have clothing advice for going to work wear a suit etc now it says make sure your neck is shown right don't wear anything right up because you need to have a neck <laughs> you know? have a nice color you know uh, wear makeup if you can <laughs> you know? and so where are the codes now about how you appear oh and the lighting you must have good lighting of course so, uh, it, it, and your frame of mind is, is certainly different when you're at home, right? Yeah. In your kitchen, in your bedroom, or in, uh, you know, the context makes a difference to how you engage. And as Bill said, a lot of our students multitask while they're doing this as well, because um, <laughs> lectures because the lectures are boring. boring. <laughs> <laughs> Even a conversation like this after a talk, after all, it's the sort of thing that would perhaps take place once you get out of the room and you go, well, in Italy yeah. you'd have to go to the, to get yeah. your coffee outside. 
yes. and you start the conversation in a different way. Here, yes. uh, as we're all sitting at home, we can <laughs> we can round up with a nice. Uh, anyway, we, we, we think it's a privilege, Marina, that we're able to talk to your students and to your colleagues. And uh, we apologise if we did anything that was uh, too quick. <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, much. we are um, grateful to be able to talk to people who are interested in these issues and uh, particularly graduate students who are going to shape the future perhaps better than we shaped it. I mean, <laughs> our generation... Our generation thought that we were making the world better around diversity, around technology, around globalisation, you name it, all the things that we thought were improving the world. And we've handed you a world, our generation, that isn't in fact better. Right. <laughs> it is better. And the, and the young people going forward, I, I saw a program with Pinkerty last night that said 75% uh, uh, of them are going to be poorer than their parents. Right into the future. Imagine that a future where that's what we've arrived at, where the world is uh, changed uh, in ways economically and socially and uh, you know geopolitically in ways that the next generation are, are not going to be as well off as our generation. And yet that's something we always believed we were able to do that we were able to create the future for the next generation to be better. So. It is a critical moment and meaning making is so vital. How we make meaning across disciplines, how we make meaning in the world is more important than ever, right? And the tools that we use are, are not adequate to the task so far because it wouldn't be as bad as it is, whether it's the planet or the economy or international uh, connections. So. I have to apologise for the babies and the young people, <laughs> uh, but but hope you have the courage, all you wonderful students who are investing their lives in understanding the world. Yeah. Well, there's nice people all over in the chat. There's uh, HR. We're done, Marina. <laughs> I think yes. I think. Uh, so, I think you've given us a lot of input and I really thank you on behalf of everyone else but I see that uh, people are thanking you in, in the chat as well. You've given us a lot of food for thought, we'll just have to eat slowly <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and go thank you. to the text perhaps and study the text and we've got the references and thank you very much. Thank and we end with the Zoom wave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I go like this. <laughs> <laughs> See you then, folks. Bye. Uh, then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Bill. Bye. 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 B